Okie dokie. Hey guys, welcome to the Serve Brew. I'm Tori Townley. I hope y'all are having a wonderful day wherever you are listening to this. Just know you're amazing and you're loved and today is going to be incredible. Um, I have special guests, Dr. Joe and Kelly Carson, um, Memphis Dream Center, Life Church Memphis, um, Yodas of Outreach, the <laughs> most amazing people you could ever meet, seriously. Like, I get phone calls of people asking for advice or just like mentorship. I'm like, Dr. Joan Kelly, Dr. Joan Miss Kelly, you've got to talk to them. So, you guys get a really big treat today just to be loved on and mentored by um, some of my personal heroes. So, welcome to the podcast, you guys. Thanks for jumping on. Hey, thanks. Yeah. Glad to be here. Yay. Um, okay, so icebreaker, I always ask, what's your coffee of choice? You're at Starbucks, what are you going to order? This is also pro tip for listeners. When you meet Dr. Joe and Miss Kelly, now you know how to make them happy when you meet them. <laughs> so what's your coffee of choice? <laughs> Kelly? Do you want to go first? Because mine's really long. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, let me go first. Um, so uh, I am a black coffee drinker, but I'm a little bit of a coffee snob. So believe it or not, I don't drink a whole lot from Starbucks because um, I don't think, so I'm a, I like the local that's going to, that's going to uh, do a pour over uh, of something a little bit exotic. I like the earthy, um, uh, maybe just a little hint of fruit um, tones. Ethiopian <laughs> is usually a great start for me. So that, so I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little bit of a coffee snob Tori. So a connoisseur there. That's, that's so funny. I did not know this. Good to know. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I could drink it black. I get shocked. Like I, I am, I'm Louisiana. Give me half almond milk and a little bit of coffee and a lot of honey and I'm set. <laughs> oh my so, God. I'm like Joe, if it's, I do black, we do black coffee most of the time. And if it's black coffee, I want a local roaster, same thing, a pour over. But I do have a Starbucks drink and it is a grande coconut milk caramel macchiato with ristretto shots, only one pump of vanilla upside down at 190 degrees. <laughs> Excuse me? So if I have a Starbucks, it's long. <laughs> Who taught, how did you even get to this point? So it's funny because three of our, we have four grown sons now, but three of them as teenagers worked at Starbucks. So I kind of learned the, the little extra things. I'll... Oh my gosh. I d that is hilarious. I'm going to have to rewind this so I can remember. That's <laughs> I've never heard an order like that in my life. And it's, it is kind of embarrassing when somebody texts me and asks, what would you want from Starbucks? It's like, well. <laughs> I'm embarrassed. I'm just going to make coffee. <laughs> oh, yeah. that was funny. I'm glad that I asked this question. <laughs> one one of my last um, guests, Brendan McDonough, he said that his favorite coffee is like the homemade, he likes it stale. He said, I like just a stale cup of black coffee. <laughs> like, he's like half cold, you know, like sat out all day. I was like, oh. oh. That's disgusting. He meant it though. So you guys win. Y'all are the coffee connoisseurs. It's so funny. Also, fun fact, listeners, um, Miss Kelly was the very first Serve Brew guest before it was called Serve Brew. Like virtual coffee is what we called it. Number one helped us break it in. And Dr. Joe, you've been on Serve Brew multiple times. I think y'all have been on like four or five times. So return guests are the best. Thank y'all. <laughs> um Okay, so today is going to be really fun. I'm sorry if you can hear my thunderstorm in the back. There's nothing I can do about it. I'm trying not to jump out of my skin. Um, <laughs> but listeners, you guys, today I asked Dr. Joe and Miss Kelly to jump in and just like really mentor us on some of their wisdom and things that they've walked through. I'm going to kind of set up a scenario that we've recently kind of talked through. And um, I just wanted them to bring some encouragement to you guys. But first, Dr. Joe and Miss Kelly, if y'all would just catch us up on like since we last talked on the Serve Brew, you guys had a lot going on, Memphis Dream Center, Life Church, but kind of where are you guys at now? What are your roles looking like? What are What's kind of on the horizon? Just give people kind of a picture of who you are, where you're at. Sure. You want me to start, Ted? So um, we now have, probably since we last talked, Tori, we have a second, we've opened a second Dream Center site. So we're, we're multi-site right now, two sites in Memphis. Um, and so it totally 
different things we're doing at each site. So um, I'm at our uh, kind of north, most North Memphis site, and we have one right in the center of the city. Um, and so at the site I'm at, we do a lot with um, children and families. So we have our after school program there. Um, we launched right at the beginning of COVID, which was, it's always fun to launch something new during the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> we launched our family enrichment center. And that is, um, we do one-on-one -on -one financial counseling. And then we have several adult education classes being offered. Um, in fact, we're excited because we have our first graduation ceremony Saturday and we have 42 adult students graduating with their high school diplomas. So that's, that's exciting for us. So that we've launched that, um, doing some career development, job placement, things like that at that location. So, um, so that's probably new since we talked to you and, and I'll let Joe take it from there. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, I think what the second site has allowed us to do is, is to always, we always think in the, uh, the, the language of next steps. Um, so it's always great to meet a need. And there's n that, that, that's always the heartbeat. It's where, our, it's where our founders, I guess you could say, uh, Pastor Matthew and Caroline and even Pastor Tommy, um, just the idea of, of meeting a need, right? And, and um, that's just a great place to start. But I've always felt like, you know, five years from now, if I'm meeting the same need, have we really, have we really gained any traction? Have we, have we, have we made any difference? And wow, what if five years from now, the person that I'm meeting their need doesn't have a need anymore? And so what are those next steps and how do we help people move forward so that they're getting those, um, those needs met, but we're empowering them so that they're, they're beginning to gain traction on their own and we're creating within the, I guess, the system that, that people live and work in, we're, we're creating this pathway. Yes. You know, so, um, so, so maybe we have to build the first two steps um, uh, and, and maybe even the side rail, but <laughs> we're giving them something to grab a hold of, something to step on so that they begin to make those moves rather than us trying to do it for them. And so it's just an empowerment model. And I just, I love it. And I love that we get to do that. And that's where this adult education, the whole family enrichment, or even our after school programming came because we started feeding kids at the schools. The school said, wow, our kids need tutors. We started doing reading programs at the school and, and tutoring ESL students. And, and, and then the next step was just naturally an after school program. We started meeting the families. Once we started meeting the families, it's like, wow, what are your needs? And, you know, wow, I don't have a job. Wow, what if we had a career development process? What if, what if we had a way for you to get your high school diploma because you, you never finished school? And so those are just some of, the, some of the ways we're always just thinking, what are those next steps? For families, and that's where that's where we've come from, and and what we're going to. Um, but Tori, just like I was telling you a few minutes ago, that doesn't mean that those transactional things, like that that cold bottle of water on a hot day, you know, candy's always a good thing. And candy's never a bad thing. I we we still bribe volunteers at church with candy, you know. Uh, so I, you know, you know, handing out candy is a good thing. Um, but just pointing people towards something. Um, you know, a, a preferable future, right? That, that, that's what we're always looking, um, ways to point people in, in a positive direction. So good, Dr. Joe. I love that. I love that you guys, first of all, you think through, like since the day I met you guys, I learned so much just of like the thinking through how people perceive and experience with us and how people are, are lifted up in dignity. And it's not we're the heroes. It's you are a treasure. You are not a homeless person. You are someone who happens to be experiencing homelessness, but you're my friend. And you guys have done such an incredible job of teaching so many of us just how to instill dignity. I think about like the Christmas shopping mall that's so famous now. It's like dream centers and churches have picked it up, but you guys were some of the very first I heard doing it. But the heart behind it was that instilling dignity in families. It's not, we're going to drop off gifts necessarily, but it's like those parents are going to be the ones to drop, to pick, pick out the gifts. So you guys have just woven that dignity throughout, but I love what you said, how it's, you don't write off 
the giveaway aspect. You don't write that off, but you think through where are we headed with this? What's the vision? And I think um, we were talking earlier, but I think about now how there is an exciting time of like people are learning and there, our blind spots are really being exposed in ways like never before of just like, hey, this is an issue. Hey, racism is a problem. Hey, you know, there's opportunities to be advocates like crazy. There's an awareness of doing things right and not being like, hey, I'm the hero to save the day. But I want to really let you guys mentor us on how to kind of build the bridge. I don't want to write off the candy giveaway because that is an open door. And I think sometimes it can be easy for someone like me who's passionate. I want to see lives change, giving away candy every single day. We're just enabling, we're doing something wrong. No, how do you navigate making sure that there's intentionality through that whole process without writing it off, building a bridge? So um, I don't know if that's necessarily a question, but could you like kind of speak to that <laughs> mentality? Like, how do you navigate that world? So I'll start. I, mean, I don't know. I was, we're not together. So, so are you gonna? <laughs> um, so you know, God's word says the gift makes way for the giver, and so we always, you know, and and I think it's it really isn't our model. It was it's the model of Jesus. He met a physical need first so many times. You know, he he fed the people. He you know, he healed somebody and it was always about their meeting the physical need. And I think, I, so I think the, the giveaways or whatever you're, you know, if you're giving food, if you're giving handy, um, that, that begins to open doors that would otherwise, like we would have never started after school program if we had not been at the schools for four years previously giving weekend food bags to the children. And that that built equity, it built trust with the family so that when we opened a program and said, we would like to pick your kids up, put them on our bus and drive them to our site for after school programming, they were like, yes, you're the people that come every week and bring the food bags. So yes, we try, you know, and so, so I think for us, it's, no matter what we're doing, it's always about the, the goal would be to build relationships. And mm -hmm. so um, we, we don't, while there are big things you can do, most of what we have learned over the years and most of what we have moved to it are consistent things, even if it's, I mean, even if it, it, even no matter what it is, whether it's a program on site, whether it is a giveaway in a neighborhood or an adopt a block, we're going to the same place, connecting with the same people over and over so that it, so they do know, they see you, they recognize you, you're a familiar face. You have the same group of volunteers going, you know, whether it's weekly or monthly, whatever that looks like. Um, Joe, you want to jump in? Yeah, no, I, I, I guess to, to add on to that, um, Kelly, is, you know, we, for years, we became, we were known as the Red Shirt Church. Um, <laughs> And, and probably a lot of other people have, I don't know if everybody wears red. I think Pastor Dino, we give him all the credit. Um, but, um, you know, Tori and your crew down, down in Louisiana. But, um, but, you know, now we've become known as the Red Bag Church, um, you know, because we, we do those red bags at the schools uh, for thousands of kids every week. And again, um, that has opened doors. It, it's just um, the way you love people opens doors. Um, and I think even our language is important. So we, um, yeah. so as I think about even our, our giveaways, we may talk about giving away things um, within our team. We may talk about serving people within our team. And there's nothing wrong with the word serve. It's a biblical term. It's what Jesus did and asked us to do. Um, but in the community, we often don't talk about giving anything away. We don't talk about serving. So we talk about sharing and we talk about walking alongside. And so just the language that we use is really important because I think it sets up a, a, a relational equity. And so, so when I'm sharing something, we're side by side, right? We, we, we stand on the same ground um, I have a resource, I'm sharing it with you, but you also have a gift to offer me. And that gift may be just something as simple as a smile or laughter 
Um, but it may be even more. You may be able to offer me insight. You may be able to offer me the opportunity to let God be a, for me to be a conduit of his love and grace that I wouldn't have if you were not standing with me. And so, uh, so we use that word uh, sharing. Um, we walk alongside people rather than serving them because, you know, I have, um, you know, I have been blind in an eye before. I have, I have, um, I have had knee surgeries before, and I have often needed people that usually count on me to help me. And somewhere down the road, um, most likely the people that we're walking alongside will give us and add value to us. And and so um, we, you know, the, the the ground is level at the cross. I know we've heard that a lot, but but that's that's the place that we serve from. And what that does for me is it keeps me from from that mindset of superiority and inferiority because often when I'm giving I have an advantage over you um, and in our society that may be true but in God's equity it's not and so we always want to try to come at um, whatever we're doing in a way that that makes sure that we're humble enough uh, that we recognize our place and the only reason we have anything to share is simply because God has allowed us to be in that spot. Um, I think too, Tori, as Joe said, no matter what we are doing, you always see it as an exchange. There's, you know, I'm, I'm giving something to you. You're giving, so, so like recently I took a group of moms. We have a once a month, like a girls night out and it's moms from the community. And we just go out to dinner while I might, might be covering the cost of the dinner, you know, um, uh, you want like we're always intentional me and some of our volunteers about asking them things and asking them and giving people a voice and and just recently someone said you know miss kelly we just we're so grateful that you're in our life whatever blah, blah, you know and i and i told him i said thank you but i said what i want you to know is i need you as much as you think you need me because the truth is we do we need one another and so even when we're giving, always look to me, it's always looking for an opportunity to give someone, to allow, allow someone to give you something. So we might be out, um, you know, we might be out in the community talking with someone and maybe I'm handing you a grocery bag and we're talking about, hey, how can I pray for you? And I might pray for them, but then I might go, hey, would you, uh, you know, there's something I want you to pray for me when you're that, you know, when you're praying, this is what I'm struggling with right now, or this is what's going on in my life. So I would really value your prayers as well. And so whatever that is, that's just one example. But there's always a way, you know, with our, maybe with our after school programming, giving the, the parents an opportunity to volunteer. Like we do one of the things, and this was actually Joe's idea, but it's been one of our most successful. We do family dinner nights at the Dream Center. But it's but doing potluck rather than us providing all the food and then everybody gets to bring something. So we're all, everyone is contributing and feels like they are. And so just things like that. I mean, you, I think you just get creative. We all know. I think it's sometimes it's, um, you know, what can you do for me? What can I do for you? It isn't all one sided, I guess. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So I just have to comment like I have so many Holy Spirit chills as you guys are talking and I genuinely mean it like seriously. Um, I, I'm just thinking and what I see is right now, I feel like optics is a big thing. And I don't mean that in an ugly way, but it's like, you have to be so careful what you say. And you have to make sure that you appear to really care for people and not be this and that, but how much grace and anointing is on you guys because it's a genuine I genuinely believe that I need these people as much as they need me I genuinely see people as a gift in God's kingdom and I always think about like the scripture about the least of these and I, I used to struggle with that like how do you label someone least and not yourself like I don't understand like least and not least but it's like God show me we're all our least in a different way. Like that's why the body of Christ is so important because someone can like you, you need each other truly. And I'm, as y'all are talking, I'm thinking of so many stories where I thought that I was the one who was doing the home repair that day. Yes. And it turns out there's a specific person I have in mind. She, they were a, like, their house was a project for serve day. They were very much so in need, got a new car, all this cool stuff. But since that day, that person has 
prophesied over my life and unlocked spiritual gifts in me that I did not know were there, like completely changed my life and my identity in Christ. And I thought, oh, well, they need help repairing their home. Like, no, I don't have the answers. I'm not the here. That person, God let me them because I needed them. So just having that shift of mentality, even it's not just on paper. It's not just to say, hey, we did this so we can look good. It's a genuine, the body of Christ is out there. It's a, like you said, side by side, we, we need each other. So I love that that is who you guys are and that's how you lead. And that's what comes out of you. And that's why this is exactly why I wanted y'all to mentor us today. Um, but I do want to kind of, I have a scenario question. So I mentioned it earlier, but I had a friend, she is, I don't know how many years she's been leading outreach. She was a little bit new to it. But um, they got a new space um, at their church to do outreach, super exciting stuff. Um, The pastor had one vision for it, which was, hey, we're going to do like a food giveaway kind of a thing that's really exciting, awesome. She had felt like that was a great idea, but also had the concerns of like, I just don't want it to be a handout, though. I don't want it to get stuck in that rut of, hey, I don't even know if that's a real need in our community. I'm not sure how to navigate this. I want to honor my pastor's vision, but I also feel like I have a perspective to bring to the table. Um, And I really just like I pointed to y'all, actually, because I felt like, first of all, you guys have such a great perspective on like we've talked about that navigation between those things where are we going how do we build intentionality but also something big on my heart right now um is just this sense of honor and i don't mean that in a way of like the pastor said so so i'm going to do so it's not just that but it's a relational like i want to be in unison and harmony on the vision so that we together can truly reach and like you guys are doing big things in Memphis, like tackling hunger and financial, like big ticket items. But it all started with this unity of vision, this anointing that you guys have together with your pastors, your leadership, your church. So again, a loaded question, not even a question, just me rattling. But I want to let you guys speak to that, to some of our younger leaders who are out there and they're passionate and on fire, speak to the importance of unity, um, submission to leadership, but also like partnering in that and owning that vision. Um, what, What advice do you have for those guys out there? Wow, that's that's quite a conversation. It's it's it's. Um, I will tell you that uh, everything you just brought up is none of it is easy. Um, so I want to I want to dispel the myth. Uh, if there's anybody out there that thinks this is great, this is all rosy, it's wonderful, and it is all of those things, but it's also hard and messy and challenging and it will challenge your heart, it'll challenge your spirit, it'll challenge your mind, Um, it'll challenge your security. Um, And and so so all of that is incorporated, included in in what you just had, a a small little moment of how do you submit, especially your vision, um, maybe even if you're the one who knows more about the community than your pastor, how do you submit your vision to the pastor's vision? And so, so I, always, uh, I always tell people, I think there's three ways to start an outreach ministry. Um, there's three things you need to consider. Um, the first thing is what's in your hand. Um, I love that God never, ever requires anything of us that he doesn't supply something. So when Moses, you know, I think about, especially when, Mo, when God asked Moses, what's in your hand? Because Moses was like, how do I prove to them I'm really from you? And he said, well, what's in your hand? And it wasn't anything. It was just stick. But, but in God's economy, that stick is a lot more powerful than a stick. And so, but you got to know, I've got a stick. You know, <laughs> I got to have something. You know, Jesus fed the 5,000, but he didn't feed them with nothing. He started with a lunch. Now, the lunch wasn't big, but the lunch was something, something he had in his hand. And I love that God's economy works that way. So but that's first. Number one. The second thing is, is, is what's in your, in your uh, pastor's heart. And so I, I, think, I think first and foremost, uh, God has placed, uh, there's an anointing and under the covering of our pastors. 
uh, whatever that role may be. And, you know, some people on this call may be under a, an elder-led church. Some people may be under a pastor-led church and whatever that authority structure is. I think um, scripture teaches us that that there is a an, an anointing that comes from being under leadership and and honoring the leadership above you. Um, so one of the we've been blessed. We've been very blessed because our pastors are amazing. But one of the first things when we started outreach is, is I asked, what do you want us to do? And the first thing he said was start somewhere. That was it. That was his that was his leading. But I felt the responsibility of making sure that he had the data he needed so that he could make an informed decision. So when he was asking for us to do something or to lead in a particular area, so hunger is you know, well, a big issue in Memphis, but it's also something on my pastor's heart, especially when it comes to children. So, yeah. I mean, there should be no child that goes hungry in our city because my pastor's like, that's not going to happen in my city. But that happened because we came to him with the information that hunger was an issue and that children were getting, going to bed hungry. That wasn't the only data we brought him, but it was the one that sparked his heart. And so we knew that that's where we, we, we needed to go. And so I think, I think it's, it's our responsibility to help our pastors know what the needs are, but then follow their direction and their guidance once they do, um, because there's a blessing that comes. The things that we're doing today would never have happened, yeah. would never have happened had we not followed his path, that vision to make sure that those kids didn't go hungry. And, and our answer to feeding and trying to help solve that childhood hunger issue has opened all of the doors that have followed. Yeah, and I think um, to Tori, you know, I mean, I know Joe said you you lay down your vision, but really when you come up under the covering of your church and your pastor, his vision becomes your vision. I mean, because that's, that's so, you know, Joe says that a lot, I'm going to steal it from him. He says, when, when you have a, when there are two visions, it becomes division and we don't ever want division. And so for us, it's, it's not about, do we have a vision? Do our pastors have a vision? Right. It's, it's our vision. It's right. it's all of our vision, and and our pastors. I mean, we completely trust them, and they're leading because you know God gave them this church. He didn't give this church to me. He didn't give the Dream Center to me. We wouldn't have a Dream Center if it wasn't for in in our case, pastors John and Leslie. You know, so um, so for us, it is it is submitting to the authority and the leadership that God has placed in our lives, and completely trusting that. You know, that doesn't, and, and I'm not saying this first, but I'm just saying in general, you may not always agree. You may think of, you may have a different idea, but that, you know, but that really, you know, and, and as Joe said, we've been very blessed because our pastors have really empowered us to, you know, chase after the things God has put in our hearts as well, you know, which has been amazing, but um, but it's really about, it, it is, it, you know, I don't think of what we do as, well, this is Pastor John's vision, so right. we're going to do it. I think this is our vision. It's all of our vision. We're a, we're a team, we're a step, you know, and so. It's so good. It's so good. And I, I do want to ask you guys, so I'm thinking about just different people I've talked to and the honor factor is so important, but I feel like too, sometimes we may take that honor as like, I'm just going to shut up and say yes and go with it. But I, and, and that's, it's, it's cool. Like when the heart is right, but I feel like understanding like the pastors who put you in your leadership role, believe in you. And they, they chose you for that reason, because you have eyes to see with a perspective that maybe no one else has you have ears to hear and they value your voice and so just understanding like there is a conversation that you are allowed to use your voice you're not supposed to loud cap or take over the submission the heart has to be right the posture but I do want people to understand that there is a difference between just yeah. blindly saying yes and going with it there's also like you 
like you guys said, you presented information. Okay, I'm empowered, but I want you to be with me on this. And there's a gift in that. I feel like it's so cool when a pastor will empower his leaders, but I love it even more so when there's like, I want to know what's going on. Like, I have an idea. I have interest. Like, great. I don't agree with your idea all the time, but I'm so glad that you're invested and that you care enough to like really do this. Because how many, how many churches have I sadly talked to where it's just kind of like, did we do something? Okay, cool. I'm good. Bye. It's, it's hard when, when there's there isn't that involvement so to welcome it and be like I'm so glad that like even if it's not the idea I would have gone with there is passion and we can work with that like you said God will bless it so are there any tips or advice that you guys would have on just learning how to own your role own your place as a leader under that submission does that make sense how to use your voice yeah <laughs> I, I, I will tell you um I'm pretty hard-headed um and <laughs> So I usually learn, you see my wife laughing at me over there. Um, so I usually learn um, after about three hits upside the head with a two by four. I very seldom learn um, from somebody's suggestion. So it takes me a little while. Um, and to be honest, Tori, it's, it, it was a season of learning, um, you know, laying down my heart for the heart of my pastor and the and allowing God to adapt the heart of my pastor to and embrace it and let it become my heart, right? I, I, that was a season. And, um, you know, everything Kelly said is accurate in the sense that it is our vision. It is one vision. It just took me a little while to figure that one out. Um, but I, I, I think that, I think that what we're trying to accomplish um, is the same we're here to love people, right? Um, you know, there's only two significant commands in, in all of scripture, and that's to love God and to love people. Um, everything hinges on those two. And if we, can, if we can love God, then that naturally creates a submissive heart. Or, I take that back. Let me rephrase that. That creates a submitted heart. So, um, so a couple of years ago, I used that word submissive uh, to a very good friend of mine, Dr. Robert Record, down in Birmingham. And I remember him stopping. We were on a walk having this conversation. I was like, Pastor, I, I'm, I'm trying my best, Dr. Record. I'm trying my best to be submissive. And he, said, and he stopped. Literally, we were on a walk. And you know, you know, Tori, I know you know Dr. Record. He walks fast. He does not walk slow. And he just stopped abruptly. And he said, whoa, whoa, whoa. God wants us to be submitted, but he never asked us to be submissive. And so if I could help somebody today, um, our heart is to be submitted to our pastors. But he never asks us to lay down our personality or our gifting um, or, the, or the things that he's placed in us. He's asking us to submit those to the authority, but he's never asking us to become submissive and bury those things. And so, so there's a sense of God's put a, God's put a mantle of, of leadership on me and, and, and of entrepreneurship and of development of people. Like I, I love the, my favorite thing in the whole wide world is to watch somebody move from point A to point B. It's just nothing better than that to me. Um, so God, God didn't ask me to lay all that down, but to find its place within being submitted to the pastor yes. uh, above me. And so I think if, if I could answer it that way, I know that's a long way to, to go, but, but I think that's the heart that we have to have. We, we have to be assured you know, God, God knew me. He formed me in my mother's womb. He's known me from the beginning of time. He knows everything about me every day. And he placed me where he placed me. There's a reason he placed me here. I don't always see it. I don't always get it. Um, and sometimes I feel like the oddball while I'm there. And even today, I can feel like an imposter, even why am I even talking about this? Why did you even call me? But there's a reason he placed me there. And the things within me, he needs me to share those with his church. Or I take, I'll even rephrase that. He can use the me to share those with his kingdom, with his body, if I'm willing to share them. 
And so my pastors have empowered me to function within my gifting. They ne haven't necessarily provided the role all the time. My roles have shifted. As a matter of fact, right now, we're still in the middle of shifting our roles, even with the Dream Center. Um, and I don't even know where that's going to land. But I know that he's put me here. And I know that I'm submitting to my pastor's leadership. But I'm utilizing the gifts and the networks and the, the relationships that I've built along the way to make sure that everything we're trying to do is going to function within that bigger vision. That is so profound. Like, I did not expect that answer to come out when I rattled the question. That was like, <laughs> bottom line, here you go. I feel like that just probably, I just feel like so much freedom given to people in that small perspective change. It's so profound, so foundational. I think that's going to really help people be able to understand, like, where do I stand in all of this and what is my place? So thank you for that. That's insane. Dr. Record is amazing too. We love you, <laughs> yeah. Dr. Record, if you're listening, I don't know. Oh man, that's incredible. I, I just, I, I think it's so important. Like I've, I've learned this a lot over the past couple of years, just how important, like letting God show you his identity for you, like what your name is in his kingdom, yeah. significance that you hold. And for me, I'm, I am like naturally, like almost a miss, like that's naturally like what I will do. It's just kind of whatever you say. All right, cool. But deep down, God's been showing me, like, I still want you to stand tall in your identity. Like I, like you guys said, like there's unique things yeah. that he has whispered to my heart and I've got to learn how to communicate them and bring them to the world because only he's like, it might just be me. Like, I don't know. So that, that shift of just, you can still be unique and stand tall in who you are. And it's so important to be connected to his spirit so that you can stand. And I don't know, I'm sorry, just I'm processing. Um, but <laughs> you guys are so great. Uh, this is incredible stuff. Um, I, I want to ask some more questions on just what advice would you give these outreach leaders, our, our favorite people, our Servolution family, just as they are refining what they're doing, they're refining their serves. You guys um, thinking through strategically the next steps, you guys are so great at that. And I feel like y'all are pioneers on, you started with the backpack giveaway and the after school, and now it's grown into one Dream Center, two Dream Centers. Now you've got like Miss Kelly sharing with me special projects that are happening in the fall, like just profound things but it's broken down in a way that I feel like we're not you no one could ever be as extraordinary as you guys but it's if we were to look back it could be attainable if we stay faithful to saying yes following favor allowing God to unlock the creativity the passions the dreams within the people in our church like this can happen for churches the the significance the influence you guys have and so all that to say for me I look at y'all and it's not so much the what you do, but it's the how you do it. And not the how as in like, here's 10 practical steps, but how like the thought process and the dignity. So what are just some like refining tips on perspective that you would give our outreach leaders as they're planning these practical things, they're planning and serve days, they're maybe launching a consistent ministry. Just what are the things we need to look out for and the perspectives we can have? I think, um... I think just what you said, Tori, you know, I tell our team and our volunteers all the time, how we care for people is so much import more important than what we do. Um, the what is kind of secondary to the how for us, I think, and, and it should be. So how do I, you know, I think we always, and what we always want to do is think what whatever we're doing, whatever we're planning, um, how is this going to make people feel? How is this going to show value? Um, how can we preserve people's dignity? You know, because if you're, you know, you're sitting in line or standing in line to get a bag of food or to whatever that is, you know, um, how does, how do we preserve dignity? And I think, you know, there are things like we talk a lot um, just real practical things like you always look people in the eye um, when you talk to them. You know, you always, um, you know, again, just stand beside. We're not, you know, uh, uh, 
you have a table, it's just like, it's, you know, it's that old customer service <laughs> that you talk about, you're walking around and standing with people, you're not, you know, you're not creating a barrier, whatever that may be. Um, and I think it's, um, and I think, again, it's, it's getting into people's world and it's doing life together, if that makes sense, whatever that may look like. Um, the more we've become doing, the more we're able to do consistent programming, the easier that is in some way. I mean, there's more opportunity for that than, but for instance, we do a monthly big mobile food distribution. We started this when, when the pandemic hit and it's once a month and we have cars lined up, but we've created what we call the vibe team and their entire, um, I guess, role or responsibility is to create a life-giving environment while people are seeing it. So they're going around and if it's cold, they're, you know, giving hot chocolate, but they're having conversations. So we've got people at all the cars while they're waiting to say, people aren't just waiting. We're having these conversations. We're talking. I mean, we've had people come to church the next day because someone in the line, you know, some, one of our vibe team invited them. Um, and the great thing is something like that, that you are doing monthly, you're going to see some of the same faces. So now our vibe team, because it's the same group of people have gotten to know. And so it's like, hey, you prayed for me last month and, or hey, how's your mom doing? I, I prayed for her, you know, we talked about this and then we're following up those prayer requests with a phone call afterwards. So we're creating this vibe team now does a personal phone call when they, so anytime you can, to me, it's anytime you can connect personally with somebody and it might just be one person out of 150, but guess what it's gonna make a huge difference for that one person. I mean, we all want to be seen. We all want to be known. No matter who we are, no matter what life circumstance we're walking in, no matter what our situation, we want to be seen and we want to be known. And so I think many times it's just thinking, how would I want to be treated? How do I want someone to treat me? Or how do I want to feel? And I want to make sure everybody feels that way, whatever that is. And yeah, I think that's, I think that's um, just to bounce off of that. I, I think, um, I don't want to assume that we know the why. And so often we, because it's outreach and because we're doing it from church or we're doing it from a dream center, there's an assumption that we know the why. Yes. And, and, and I think we need to, that should be a constant reminder. So as we, as we are talking to our volunteers, every single time, we have to remind them, why are we doing this? We're doing this because of the heart of God. We're doing this because God never wants to, he'll leave the 99 to go find the one. We're doing this because that's who our God is, and that's who lives on the inside of us. And if he truly lives on the inside of us, we can't help but do that. And so we're just constantly reminding um, ourselves <laughs> as well as our team. And the other part of that is our responsibility is not just for the, to the people that we are going to serve. Our responsibility is to those who are serving alongside of us. Um, and and we, are, we are pastoring, we are shepherding the people that walk with us along these, this journey. Many of them two months ago, we're in line, you know, and now we're serving those in line. Um, and so we have to just remember that everybody is not as far along down the journey. Everybody's not in the same place, but we are all in the same level ground. And so it's just reminding people that, you know, like Kelly said, how we do it. I, 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 when she was talking about, um, greeting the same people over and over the sweetest sound you will ever hear is the sound of your own name yes and there's <laughs> there is nothing there's nothing in all of earth no song no melody uh no speech no sermon that will ever be as sweet to your ear as the sound of your own name um so whether we're we're talking to Miss Jones at her door 
and an adopt a block, or we're we're talking to you know a, a guy on the street that they the guys call you know feet, you know because he's always got something wrong with his feet all the time. No matter who it is that we're talking to, looking them in the eye and calling them by name is the most valuable thing we can offer them. And so, um, so I just think, I mean, that, that's, that's kind of the how, right? It, it, it's about putting ourselves aside, taking the time. You know, we don't, generally, if we're offering any kind of a hot meal, we always ask our volunteers, we're not here to serve other people. We're here to eat with them, break bread with them. So make a plate for two or three people, then fix you a plate and go sit next to them and listen to their story, know their name. Um, because that's the, the gift that we add is the gift of dignity, the gift of hope, the gift of opportunity. Uh, and man, sometimes the best opportunity is just sharing your hurt with somebody else. And so, so anyway, I know that's, uh, that may and, not have answered your question. But. I want to say, and Tori, I think so often, and I know we've probably all done it, probably everybody on this call, and I, I can so quickly slip back into you see someone that maybe is in a different life circumstance than you or even doesn't look like you or, and you and, and in our, most of us in this middle-class world, we want to think we so often, our default is what's wrong with them, you know, if something, and yet we have to shift our mindset, you know, and we say this often with our team and our volunteers, um, we can no longer ask that question. You have to ask what has happened to them because there's always a story behind the behavior or the situation. And so, so, and then that just changes your whole perspective on even the way you see people. It, you know, it's not, it's, man, what, what have they walked through that I don't know? You know, and, and I think I've, we've said it before to where I think even talking to you that we never assume we know someone's story if we haven't taken the time to hear their story. So we can't, you know, again, assumptions have no place in outreach. They really, and in loving people, you know, so. Wow, wow. That's, you guys have gotten so many, like I've got so many notes on the side here. It's, again, there's just so much Holy Spirit dripping from you guys. And I, yeah, I just, what I want to honor in y'all is how much room for the Holy Spirit to work that you've given, not just in your own lives, but I just see it in how you've led in giving people margin to feel and receive the Holy Spirit's promptings on their own, teach, putting them in environments where they can be sensitive as a servant, at, not a servant, as a volunteer. Um, <laughs> we don't say serve, we no, say- we, No, the servant's <laughs> good, the servant's <laughs> good. I was like, wait a minute, my language, but giving volunteers a chance to feel empowered in their own Holy Spirit and not just, hey, here's the play, run it. But like, what do you see? What are you hearing? Who can you lean into? And I think that that beauty, even just the pace, I haven't actually been with you guys on an outreach, but I know that your pace is not this hustle and hurry. It is, let me move to his rhythm and make sure that all of us are grooved into that. And that is where his magic has place to work and move and happen, breathe. That's so exciting to me. So I just really feel like our listeners are so encouraged. I don't even know, I sent you all questions. I don't know what we said. I don't know what I asked. I don't know where it went, but I know it was gold. And I feel like the Holy Spirit just pulled things out of you guys today that needed to be said. So I really appreciate that. Um, I have a couple of closing questions and you guys please feel free to like, preach more if you want to say what <laughs> God tells you to say but yeah any first of all any like closing pieces of advice you guys would share with our listeners with our family um anything they need to know yes I have one okay stay healthy get healthy find somebody um somebody that you can be honest and open with and share your own hurts and your own pain and um, who can encourage you and strengthen you and empower you. Take a day off, um, rest. Um, you know, for me, it's finding four or five hours to be out in nature by myself or, or with a good friend and um, or loving the grandbabies or, you know, um, so, so be, take care of yourself. Um, make sure you don't um, 
you don't run on an empty tank too long. Yeah. Um, and, and I would even say your spiritual health. So um, this past year, um, I pulled out some old books, had to reorder some that aren't even in print anymore that I read 25 years ago and, and found them online as a used copy and ordered them again. And we reread things that stirred my heart and ministered to me years ago that I needed again. And so, um, so find that. Don't, don't run on empty too long. Make sure you, you, you're healthy. So good, Dr. Joe. And I'm going to have to ask you what these books were because the next question is recommend <laughs> something for us to read. So now yeah. we got to hunt all these books down. <laughs> yeah. So, so there's a, there's an author named Francis Frangipane and I fell in love with him years ago and he wrote a book called Love, Holiness, and the Pursuit of God. Hol and holiness, holiness, Truth, and the Presence. There it is. <laughs> holiness, Truth, and the Presence of God. I knew I'd get it wrong. Anyway, the Holiness, Truth, and the Presence of God. And if you get a chance um, that's a quiet time book um, that will challenge your heart and, and bring you to a place where you really love and appreciate and, and uh, seek God more. Uh, Tori, Tori, there's a book and you might have done it um, before, but we're taking our volunteers through it actually this summer. We've taken our team through it. Joe and I've read it. This is my third time to go through it, but it's Understanding a frame, the Framework of Poverty by Ruby Payne. She has done some amazing work in the area and it's really from a cognitive approach, but it's, it's really, um, I think we have to understand what poverty is and what it looks like and what, you know, really understand it from a, from a perspective of poverty, not because we often, all of us filter things through um, the life that we live and our own experiences. And so if I haven't experienced that, I need to figure out a way to understand so I can walk well with people and love people well. And then there's another app that you can get. It's actually a game you can do with your team, but it's a training and it's called Spent, S-P-E-N-T. And basically it's a game where you become, you become a character in the game and you live a day in the life of poverty. You live a day in poverty and it begins to help you understand the decisions that Pete, you might have to make a decision. Am I going to feed my children or I'm going to pay my light bill? And really helping you understand um, you know, the tough decisions people have to make and the hard things that we may never walk through, but it gives us a, I think it helps you begin to understand. So I would highly recommend that book um, as a training tool and as a, for, for anyone, for yourselves, but also for any of your team or volunteers. Um, it's, it talks a lot, it's written kind of for educators in a school setting with children but it applies to, it applies to anyone. And the other thing is Karen Purvis Institute. These aren't all books, but when you sent this question, I thought about the things we've begun to realize probably in the last year to year and a half, we have um, really begun to understand the importance of trauma-informed training. So to understand what trauma is, what ACEs are, which are adverse childhood experiences, that we all have some of those, but there are people who have many more, you know, and really beginning to try to understand how do we truly, how do we help people? How do we help them walk through some th experiences? Walk through? And so Karen Purvis Institute is from Texas um, Christian University, TCU, and they have a, it's called Trust-Based Relational Intervention. And it's a training you can do, it's fully online, not very expensive. And we have taken our whole team through that. And that's really important. I mean, I think that's, I think trauma-informed care and understanding poverty are huge from a, from a perspective. I'm sorry, I've got something on my stove that I'm gonna turn off while I'm talking. So, sorry, <laughs> I was cooking something, I'm gonna turn it off. Oh no, the whole no, time. It's fine. it's fine, but I just wanted to turn it off burned your lunch I'm sorry <laughs> you didn't it was for dinner and it's fine <laughs> I was cooking something but um so, so for me those kind of three things those are huge I think 
becoming wow. more. That's amazing. I will, I will probably text you to get the link so I can make sure that we link to that or at least point people in the right direction to find more info on all of that. Dr. Joe, we're going to have to photocopy those books. I don't know how people are going to find them. <laughs> <laughs> but that, I will, I will make notes and we'll do all the research we need to do. But I really just like, I, I love to lean in. I think it's so important to lean in and you guys have such hearts of compassion and pure hearts for Jesus. And if we want to lean into that, I think leaning into the things that you're leaning into is really important. And so I just thank y'all for sharing that info, but also just for pouring into us today. Anytime I hang with y'all, I just feel like I've been with Jesus for hours and I don't think there's anything better than that. So thank you guys. We honor you. Thank y'all so, so much. You're the best. Thank you. We love Thanks. you, Lori. Thanks for having us. All hey, right. Anna. Oh, I Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say big shout out because if anybody is actually listening and watching, um, man, I encourage you. Thank you for what you're doing. You're making an impact. Don't stop. Don't don't quit. Stay in there. Hang in there. Um, just remember that um, in in the greater economy, man, you're adding value. And so yes. that's that's what it's really all about. Amen. Amen. That's so good. I did know that. So good. Um, thank you guys. I forgot to ask social media. How can people find you guys? I have to ask that one every time. <laughs> I'll get in trouble if I don't. Well, if you're asking me, all you're going to find on my social media probably is pictures of my granddaughters, but, um, <laughs> That's the best. but anyway, it's, uh, it's at Dr. Joe Carson, D R J O E C A R S O N. And you can pre pretty much find me anywhere on Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn or whatever all those things are. <laughs> all the things. Cool. Um, I'm, at, I'm at KF Carson on Instagram, but our Dream Center is Memphis Dream Center CTR. So it's at Memphis Dream Center CTR or it's Memphis Dream Center three words on Facebook. So. Perfect. Okay, awesome. I will write that up in the show notes so people can follow you guys and your grandbaby adventures and all the things. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Thank y'all so much again. Thank you guys. Um, listeners, we're so glad that you jumped in today and we will see you next time on the surf group. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.